Hey, John here. Let's talk about pointers. But first, let's review what we already know about variables, okay? For the most part, variables always have a name. You can create some that are anonymous, but that's a, a kind of a unique case. Uh, for our intents and purposes, let's just consider the ones that actually have names for now. Um, like, you know, X, Y, like J and K, like what we're used to seeing all the time. Your variables will have values. They may be constant. They may, you know, be uh, dynamic, uh, but they have a value, right? The value has a type. Right, got an int or a float or something like that. And the, the type of a variable implies how many bytes it consumes, how much memory does it take to store the value of that thing, right? The physical size. And you can ask what it is by saying size of and give it the name of a variable, or you can say size of and give it a data type, like size of double, you know, if I wanted to. Or I could even say size of double uh, open square bracket 10. How, much, how big are 10 doubles? An array of 10, right? So that's the type. They have a scope. You know, when can you actually use that, uh, the name of that variable, right? So here's, for example, this might be a global variable. Obviously, here it's defined outside of my function. So I can access this Q variable anywhere in my program if I want. Just directly refer to it. It's global. On the other hand, this variable J over here can only be used in the subroutine f here right and technically what happens is that i can use it in subroutine f in the block which is a open curly to close curly span of code right in the block within which it is defined all right this j we say is in scope from here down to the close curly within the block that it's defined, all right? So that's the scope of J. The scope of K starts where it is defined and goes down to the closed curly where it is uh, a member of, right? The block that it's in. And the scope of R starts here and goes down to its closed curly, just like that, all right? You cannot refer to, in other words, I can't do this, all right? Because the, the, the program does not know about R yet. It hasn't seen it. R is down here. It can't be accessed up here. Okay? That, that would be illegal. All right? Now, you might think that the lifetime and the scope are the same thing. But actually, they're not. Okay? When is the value of a variable constructed? When is it initialized? And then when is it thrown away? Well, in this example here, the lifetime does match the scope. We're going to see, though, that this is not always the case, all right? Uh, in this particular situation, like I said, they are the same because these are automatic variables. They will be constructed at the point at which the program encounters the line where they're defined, and it'll get destructed when it goes out of scope in the closed curly down here, okay? The static one, this will be our first time where we see a, a lifetime that's not really the same as the scope, if I make R static, it's constructed. Its lifetime is forever. It's the same as this global up here. It's constructed before main starts executing. And it doesn't, it maybe F never even gets called in your subroutine. It doesn't matter. R is R was constructed before main starts going, and it stays there until main is done, and then it is destructed because it is a static variable. Now, its scope is from here to the close uh, curly for the block, right? But its lifetime is the lifetime of the entire program because it is an uh, element of the static storage class. And because we have no initialization on here, the default value will be zero, and therefore it'll be placed in the BSS. We know that. This one up here is global. It's also static by default, but it has a non-zero initial value, therefore it will go in the data region, okay? Now let's talk more about the location where the things are actually stored, right? We already talked a little bit about the data region and the BSS here. We know where those are. Uh, what about these local variables, right? Well, they go inside the activation records for the subroutine when the subroutine is called. They go on the stack, the program call stack that fills up with the activation records, all right? Now, 
let's think a little bit more about these locations. In languages like C and C++, you can ask where the values of these variables are stored, and you can, you can access them that way. You can share that information. You do that using a pointer variable. Now let's look at some pointers. Let's take a look at what's going on here. What do we got here? We got a function, we got main, here's this scope, and we have a single block of code, right? Open curly to close curly. Inside there, we've got these two local variables, right? We have an I and we have this funky thing that looks like whatever star. We have an I and a P, all right? We know what this is, an I, we set it, initialize it to five. So this is gonna allocate a, a variable in the call stack. We know it's 32 bits because we explicitly said so. Therefore, we know it's four bytes. And the initial value will be five. If we can change it down here, great. Otherwise, it'll remain five until the block exits down here, at which time this will get thrown away. We also have a P, and the scope of P starts where it's defined and continues the block that encloses where it was defined. This, the way you read this is P is a pointer to a 32-bit integer. You read these things from right to left is the point. The star means that P is a pointer. We say pointer to an int 32. How does this thing work? Well, a pointer variable is not an int32. A pointer variable is a place to hold the value that is the address of a variable whose type is int32. So it points at an integer somewhere else is what I'm getting to here. And the way you do that is like this. If I have an int32 called i, and I want to know where it is in memory, I can say p, you know, I'll do this because p is a pointer, okay? And then I can say p equals the address of the i variable here, okay? Now, in order for this to work, I have to make sure that p is a pointer to the right kind of data type. Okay, you don't want to say, you know, P points to a double and then say, okay, assign the address of an int to something that's supposed to be pointing at a double. The compiler will, will gripe at you if you try to do that, okay? The ampersand in this context means address of. Don't get confused because the ampersand also can be used for these things called references that are not pointers. They don't work like pointers. They're for a completely different purpose, all right? So what happens after we do that? We say things like uh, P points to I, and we say that ampersand I is the address of I. That's how we speak about these things, all right? Now, what am I going to do with my code down here? I'm going to say I equals, this is going to print a little text out, and then I'm going to print the value of I. Then I'm going to print the size of I, okay? And then I'm going to print, what's the, I'm going to print the ampersand I. So I can actually do all these things, right? I can say, take the address of some variable called I and print it, print the address. Now I can also say, what's P? I can actually print the value of P. Well, P is going to be the address of I, right? So when it says P equals whatever over here, it should give me the same value that's printed up here, right? I can ask how big a P is. I mean, P is a variable. So it has a size, it has a location, right? And I can actually even ask for the address of P itself. Why not? It's a variable. You can have an address of a pointer to an integer. That's what this thing here represents. All right, now we saw this hex dump once before. It might make a little more sense, I think, as we go here. So what I'm gonna do after I print all this stuff out, let's go ahead and skip a blank line and make this a little more readable. If we spell it right. 
So we're going to print out these thingies here. We'll skip a blank line, and then we'll dump out the contents of 100 bytes of the memory, starting at the address where the value of i will be stored when the program runs, OK? We should see this 5 among you know 96 other bytes of stuff that will come out. So let's go ahead and compile this. So what do we got? I is 5. There's no shock. Size of I is 4. The address of I is this. Okay? Just because that's where it ended up when the program ran. If we ran this program twice, it could easily end up in a completely different place the next time we run it. Look at that. It did. This time it and it ran at 7 F F E C blah 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 3 2 F yada yada, yada totally different address. Why? because the operating system puts it wherever it wants, all right? Now, there's a reason that this varies. If you're heavily into computer security, this is done on purpose. The Linux uh, operating system that we're running on, every time we run a program, at least in the, in the mode that, 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 uh, for the, operating, the kernel that I'm using, it will randomize where the uh, stack uh, begins every time your program runs. And you can want to understand more about that. You can go and research, uh, you know, randomized stack and things like that in uh, Google, do some Google searches on that security of uh, stack locations, all right? My ra the point is by randomizing this, people can't take advantage of the fact that they would happen to know that every time your program runs, your variables are stored in a known place. It kind of randomizes where things are in memory, makes it harder to write viruses is what I'm getting at, okay? But that side note, um, so what do we? What's our takeaway here, right? So an, uh, a variable has a name, it has a value, it has a size, and it has a location. What's more, we can ask the the the, the computer when it's running where it is. So you can see I printed out the value of p here. This thing here matches that value right there. Now these are in hex. There's some links to how you read hex numbers in the in the lecture notes for my course. I'll try to put a link to the course website below uh, in this video if you're watching it on uh, YouTube or something like that. So you can find those if you really want. Well, you'll find out that these are in base 16 if you don't already know that, which means the digits of these numeric values go from 0 through 9 and A through F. So F is the biggest digit, biggest face value you can have. And almost everything prints out addresses in hexadecimal form because that is the more natural way to represent an address in a computer. All right, so what do we got here? We said P equals ampersand I, so it doesn't shock anybody, I hope, that you see ampersand I being printed out for the value of P. We can ask how big P is, and notice that the size of P is 8. The size of a pointer on my computer is 64 bits, which is 8 bytes, because I have a 64-bit operating system. That's really what this means. How big is the address of uh, the memory uh, bytes? in your computer. That's really what the 64-bit operating system jazz is all about, if you never really knew what that meant, okay? And you'll notice in, specifically that this size of the pointer has nothing to do with the size of the thing it points at, okay? That's why I beat this point here, all right? Uh, no pun intended. All right, now we can also ask where in the memory is the pointer value itself located? And you can see I got another address. It's a variable, so it has a place. Now, you saw I printed out in my program, I said just print out 100 bytes of memory in decimal, starting at the address where i is stored. Well, we know i is stored here because I printed it out at uh, 7FFF20E9398C, okay? And this is a very standard way of doing hex dumps like this. I think we've seen this before. You print the address over here, and it's either modulo 16 or modulo 32, depending on the uh, environment that you're using. Most of them are modulo 16, which means it will end in a zero over here. Okay? And since I said, hey, print out memory starting at, you know, such and so, blah, 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 ending with 8C... And the report has to uh, begin it at something that ends in a zero. It will skip the bytes until it gets up to 
what I asked for, all right? And it wants to align it, like I said, all these be modulo 16. And you can see the five, right? I is set to five. This is a little endian machine. So the value is at, in hacks is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 5. And five in hex is the same as five in decimal. I purposely assigned it a number less than 10 so that it would be easy for us to find, all right? There's the value of I stored in memory. Now, I knew that the P would come after the I, which is why I just said, here, print some extra, right? Look at this address here. ff 7 ff 20 e 93990 Well, that's the number right here, isn't it? P is eight bytes in size, starting in memory at this address. There is the value of P, again, in little endian form. The value of P is the address of I. So look closely in here. 00007FFF20E9398C. That's the value right there. Okay. Now, printing out addresses and hacks and memory dumps, like I said, this is the the ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the time when you look at memory, this is how it's done. This is always in hex. That's why address uh, pointers are always printed out in hex. By default, you'll notice I didn't ask it to print it out in hex. It just did. That's because that's how this is uh, basically it's always done this way. All right, so now, because we allocated these variables on the stack, it just so happens that we know now that we're looking at a part of the program call stack. We're looking at uh, a, a part of the activation record for the main function. Okay, I don't know what else is in here. There may other variables, uh, other things in the activation record include things like what where where main is supposed to go when it's done running right? There may be another address in here somewhere that tells it where to go. Look at this number down here. Just by coincidence, you'll notice it, it sort of looks similar to the value up here, right? I'm going to take a wild guess. It's possible that this could be the return address or this one down here. Look at all, all these things could be addresses, could be coincidence. I don't know. But if you poke around in here, you'll figure some stuff like that out. You can actually read about it. This is going to be fu fully documented. The activation record for a subroutine and what main looks like and so on, this is all documented. You can Google search it out. If you really want to know, uh, look for something called a CRT0. Uh, this is a fairly advanced topic, okay? But you can find out what CRT0 is supposed to look like for a C++ program. Just Google it. And I'm using the GNU compiler. If you're using the GNU compiler, you can actually find the source code of this thing called CRT0.C, which is the thing that builds the stack frame for main before it starts going. It's provided by the operating system. Okay, I digress. Uh, what's the takeaway here? Variables have a size and a value and a place where they are located in the memory. Thanks for watching. See you next time.